Hi, I'm Mary Greendale, and welcome to another episode of Just Thinking. It's the end of a quarter, and we're going to be talking with Carolyn Dykema, our state representative. We'll see what's been going on and what's coming up in the next part of the year. Carolyn. Well, top of my list is uh, traffic congestion. Ooh. Um, with the great economy that we have here in Massachusetts, one of the, the I guess, the, the less desirable side of that is the amount of traffic congestion we have, um, not just on our major roads like the Pike, but we see it here in town all the time. I think, you know, sure. we see it downtown. It's just everywhere. Um, so one of the specific projects that's uh, top on my list of concerns is the Alston Viaduct um, reconstruction, mm -hmm. which is the bridge by BU on the yeah. Mass Pike. Yeah. So it is a critical um, gateway for it's, all of our commuters. And it's for both. It ends up impacting, if I understand correctly, both those that are going to the Alston exit, but also those who are going in town. Directly in town. Yeah. Yep. So either way, you're not going to bypass uh, some impact. Not only that, but it affects both the um, highway and the train. So there will Good be point. an extended period of time, like we were talking about five years of construction um, that will uh, create a real bottleneck there for their, you know, for our commuters. So potentially wow. one down to one track for the train, potentially decreasing the number of, of lanes on the highway. So you can imagine, you know, this is enormous. So the planning is happening now. And we have organized uh, all along the line, actually, from Worcester all the way into Boston, all the legislators on that line who are advocating for um, some serious consideration of our commuters in terms of mitigation and how we construct the project to make sure that we leave as many options open for people as possible um, in the planning, but then also to create new options like park and ride or shuttles or you know creative train service to make sure that we can keep people flowing through that that interchange. So um, there have been public hearings. Some of our folks have, have gone to one. There was one in Framingham. We're continuing to listen and really push the administration um, to give us something um, in, in the short term. But then that leads into the long-term conversation, which we've had before about, you know, we're going to be living through this as commuters for a long time. What are we going to end up with at the end? You know, we need to be better. Um, from a commuting perspective at the end than we are today. We need um, you know, more commuter rail options, really, mm -hmm. you know, a, a more consistently maintained turnpike. So we are starting to, as a delegation, kind of think out of the box about what do, what do we want to ask for um, of the administration uh, as we go through this process. So it's, it's a lot, there are a lot of fingers in this pie, as you can imagine, a lot of voices, and we're just trying to establish kind of our um, uh, regional uh, center of gravity to make sure that we get some benefits out of this. So expectations looking forward when you're saying uh, what do we want to look like at the at the end of this? Yeah. The goal would be what? I would like to think we will be a you know 22nd century public transit system on the commuter rail. You know electrification of the commuter line somehow either with current or future technology. Uh, more frequent all day long mm -hmm. rail service in both directions. In both directions, all throughout the day, so that you have you know commuters coming here to Boston as well as commuters Reversed. from Boston yep. um, coming out here. So really, something that looks more like um, more like a subway system, but it's still a commuter rail. Sure. Um, the only and, difference being it's above ground, maybe. Uh, Is that the only difference, or um, you know, I mean, I think there are a lot of technical differences. Um, I, I think the frequency wouldn't be quite as much as a, as a, a subway, a subway mm -hmm. but you're looking at the same level. And in fact, some of the new cars, they're called EMUs um, and DMUs. EMUs? Yes. Electric Mobility Unit. EMUs. Those um, are wingless birds, you know. Uh, I do know, I did know <laughs> that, Mary. Look at you. You are, you are a Renaissance woman. <laughs> Um, so these units are actually self-contained, so you don't have a locomotive that pulls cars. You actually have an engine on each car. So you, oh. can, you can put together as many cars as you want oh. or break them up into smaller units to run more frequently. Oh, how clever. A lot more flexibility there. Are they made in China? Um, no, they're made all over the place. Oh. They're made in Europe. They're made, you know, um, all over. And the technology is still evolving which tends to be the challenge. You know, we don't want to be the guinea pigs right. for technology yeah. for this yeah. kind of investment, but yet we still want to be looking far enough ahead that we're not tied to the old um, technology. So, so our challenge is how do we improve service in the near term, which means upgrading and refurbishing a lot of the locomotives that we have to get us through the next two to five years 
until we can get a really long-term, big-picture plan for transit um, that's kind of next-generational. I think HCAT needs to do a show. You know, we need to do something that's at night, maybe at town hall, up at town hall or at the library or something, and encourage people to come and talk about this. Because when you start talking about what do you want it to look like in five years, you're going to have those who are concerned about the the transit in and out of Boston, but you're also going to have those that are concerned about the sidewalks and the people who are concerned about the bicycles mm -hmm. and the people who are concerned about carpooling, which has really kind of gone the way of, uh, I don't know, the buggy. Um, you know, nobody talks about carpooling particularly anymore. Um, but I think it would be great if we could just kind of get our viewpoint. What is it that we want right here in Holliston? And then maybe that will inform other communities or you or maybe nobody but the point is maybe we should try to do That's a conversation a good idea. here. I'd love to participate in that. Yeah, absolutely. And and if you have other legislators from other towns who then bring in the perspective of yeah, but have you thought about this kind of thing? That might be great too. So let's let's do that off air but um, let's great. talk about doing that. Um Along with transportation goes housing, as far as I'm concerned. Um, if you don't, the, all of the things that are obvious, if you don't have a way to get to where you're going to go, go to work, um, from where you live, you've got a big, huge gap. And we have a huge gap here in that there aren't a lot of resources. Obviously, we've got the, the bus, but the bus is limited in any number of ways. Um, so with housing. There is now a committee here in town called Market Affordable Housing. So we're looking at um, housing that would be available to someone similar to me, but not necessarily my age group. We downsize. Yes, we have a little bit of money. We put the money away and say, that's my health care. Uh, should I need long-term care or whatever because I don't have long-term care insurance? Um, so that's all set aside, and now I'm either going to rent or uh, whatever, okay? There is nothing to buy. There is no place to take that investment and keep it going in a housing unit because there just isn't anything that comes in at the $200,000, 250000 $300,000 range. <laughs> There's just nothing. So, especially when you, when you consider that a lot of land that is just one building lot can run around $270,000 mm -hmm. right now, okay? That's ridiculous. We can't expect young people who are just trying to get established, old people who are trying to downsize, middle-income people who are working, single parents, whatever the combination of things, you can't expect that to be the case. Mm -hmm. But all of our programs are targeted to subsidies. They're all targeted to... Um, factors that, you know, the low income and that kind of thing. Those may apply in some of these cases, but not necessarily in all of the cases. It's really just sort of a market issue. So what we're trying to do is assemble a good cross-section of people in the development world, government world, real world, all those other places, um, just to find out what is it we would be looking for. Is there a way that you can you know, create villages of tiny houses? Is there a way that you can create duplexes tucked in here and there? Can you take the multifamilies that you have on Washington Street and convert them? Shoot me now, our house was six. We had a house at 1090 Washington. It was a six-family house. We converted it to a single-family house uh, back in the 80s. Um, but, you know, seriously, nobody needs that much room. You know, there's, it's just a huge house. So what stands in the way very often are the zoning laws. Mm -hmm. And having spent so much time on the planning board yourself, you know very well, you know, where those are. What in Governor Baker's housing proposal will affect our local zoning? Is there anything in there that mm -hmm. we can use? So, as you know, you know this is the kind of the eternal question, um, especially in suburban, more rural communities, is that you know we like the atmosphere that um, was created by the traditional zoning, which is bigger lots, um, lower density. There's a recognition, a growing recognition of this affordable housing concern, especially for a lot of the older folks in the community who are doing exactly, you know, what you're saying. They're looking for kind of the next step. They don't want the big house. There just isn't anywhere for them to go mm -hmm. to stay in the community. So um, Massachusetts being a strong home rule state, uh, you know, I would 
you know, the governor in his bill, and I would say probably the gen general legislature, you know, kind of defers to the communities to, to set kind of what they want their communities to look at. So it's sort of this balance about, you know, what's the state going to do versus um, how much control the towns have over their zoning. So the approach generally tends to be, you know, empowering communities with tools that they can pick from to kind of create a scenario that, that works for them. So um, two things I'll mention. One is the Housing Choice Initiative, which was created by the administration, I think, two years ago, um, where if the community commits to meeting certain housing goals and commits to making housing kind of a priority in the town, they get increased access um, and consideration for programs like MassWorks grants and other types of funding that come through the state. So it's more of an incentive-based approach. Holliston is a housing choice community uh, and got some money, I believe, in the first year of the program. So that's, that's good news, and I think there's more opportunity there for the town, especially if you're getting organized with this new committee. The, the bill that has been actually a work in progress, this would bill around zoning was being talked about well before, when I was doing regional planning before I was in this role. And it's sort of over the years just been whittled, whittled down from I think a 40 page document to, a, to like a two page document, <laughs> um, which was supposed to actually move before the summer break, before yeah. our recess in August and it just kind of got hung up. But uh, it's the governor's priority. And would be a, um, a local, what do we call it, a local um, choice or an enabling statute? Um, a local option local. bill. So there are a, a range of, of kind of zoning softening tools, the most notable of which are changing the majority at town meeting that's needed to pass zoning from two thirds to a majority. Mm -hmm. So it would not unilaterally change that. Um, the town would have to adopt at town right. meeting this new kind of, you know, By law. more facilitative yeah. um, zoning, which is a healthy conversation, you yeah. know, to have with, with the community. And it's but, not the yeah. solution, you know, but I think it's, it's one more way to um, make it easier to overcome some of these zoning hurdles. But you'd want to have that conversation starting before the day that you had the bylaw on the town meeting floor, because I think what you don't want to do at town meeting is just end up with the friends of the bride, friends of the groom battle on town mm -hmm. meeting floor that's just, you know, who gets more people out. That You know what I mean? So I mean, it seems to me like if, in fact, this thing passes, then we need to start mm -hmm. that conversation and, and maybe that's something this committee can help with. Well, I think the more important thing, truthfully, is the proactivity, you know, of the town's 40B, which, as yeah. you know, is a um, really the most powerful tool that we mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. um, relative to zoning has its pros and cons, yeah. right? Um, the goal of 40B is is not to have developers, you know, be able to come in and build where they want, although sometimes, you know, that's the unintended consequence, I guess. The goal is to encourage cities and towns to say, you know what, we don't, we would rather have control rather than give over control to someone else, so we're going to come up with a plan, and we as a town are going to find those areas that we want greater density, that makes sense for greater density, so that we don't get these, you know, projects going in inappropriately where they should be. So, you know, programs like um, the Habitat, mm -hmm. Holliston's mm -hmm. been great, you know, another yeah. Habitat house in the making. Um, if, if you could identify a location mm -hmm. um, that more density makes sense, that people can see and understand, um, I think that makes, you know, tying some kind of town meeting discussion to a, an appropriate location mm -hmm. um, is probably a, a great way to do it, rather than to kind of open up the Pandora's box and people don't right. really know what's going to happen. Right. Or where. Right. And constrain it to a place where people can feel confident that, that it's going to be the right project. Okay. All right. But that's something to keep in mind, and I think we'll make sure that the committee watches this episode of uh, Just Thinking so that everybody knows right. what we're talking about. All right. So is there anything else in that housing bill that we need to be aware of that uh, I've kind of... No. I mean, it, again, it's, it's become so limited yes. at this point. It really is very bare bones. And, and That's what happens every time. I mean, I've lived through two or three iterations of this at a state level, and it's just what happens because... Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, local home rule stuff really gets in the way. Sometimes. And actually, what's what's interesting is what's holding it up now is people that say it doesn't go far enough. Yeah. It's oh. not that people are opposed to what's yeah. in there. They think it, there should be more. So yeah. uh, it's a priority of the governor. I, would, I think it's the highest priority right now of the governor. Yeah. So it's going to be among the horse trading, I think, of, of bills that are going to come to the floor this fall. Hmm. Okay. All right. Your turn. 
So uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about a bill of mine that is coming to the floor later today, which is the Women's Rights History Trail. So, neat story, I have a, had a former colleague, a female colleague, who represented North Adams. Her name was Gail Ann Caridi, and she passed away hmm. uh, just over two years ago um, of cancer, which was, you know, terrible. She's just an inspirational woman, and she had filed this bill um, not long before she passed away, actually. And so, a colleague of mine, who is a member of the minority party mm -hmm. uh, from Shrewsbury, who serves with me and represents Westboro, uh, and I filed a bipartisan bill to establish this Women's History Trail coming into 2020, which will be the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. So we were really excited to get the call. We actually got the call last night oh, wow. that the bill is coming to the floor today, um, and we'll make it through the House and onto the Senate. And our hope is that we can get that done and signed by the end of the year so that we can start um, working on implementation um, coming into the anniversary next summer. And as we were saying earlier, the thing that gets me excited about this legislation is that it really will be a, a statewide effort where the Office of Travel and Tourism will, um, what we're envisioning, literally create a map, right, that you can start. Um, hopefully at the state house, yep. and get your map, and it will take you all around the Commonwealth um, to celebrate these women and hear their stories. Yeah. And the thing that I love about it is communities are going to be able to pick their own women that they would like to highlight and elevate in their communities and kind of educate their themselves about the yep. women yep. that have made history. And the reason. I get kind of excited about it is my daughter Julia, you know, Julia, right, she's, sure. so she's 20 now. So one time she said to me, you know, we were kidding around, she said, Mom, you know, you have to see it to be it. And I think that's really true. Like when you see oh, uh, those good. who have come before you yeah. that sort of look like you and, and come from a place like you, it inspires you to, to have the confidence to say, you know what, if, if she it. can do that, I can do that too. Uh, and so elevating these women, and some of the stories are absolutely remarkable as we're doing some of the research, what women have done. There is a woman, um, Angela Grimke, um, from Hyde Park, who was uh, the first woman to speak before a legislative body mm -hmm. here in Massachusetts, and she spoke to the Massachusetts legislature on the abolition of slavery and presented 20,000 petitions or 20,000 signatures Signers. from women in Massachusetts in support of that effort. How did and she who get has 20, heard that story, right? How did she get 20,000 signatures in Massachusetts before we had, like, you know, online Social petitions? media. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, my gosh, I've had to do that kind of thing, and that's not easy. Really, that's a puzzle. Well, you know, that's a, it leads to Joanne Hulbert and I have talked about there are unsung heroes in every community, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it, certainly there are unsung heroines or women in, in Holliston. We talked about doing a play. So maybe I'll haul her out and see if she wants to go back and we'll do some more research and see. Maybe we'll put together a play about uh, women's history in Holliston. It's, I love it. You know, why not? Why not? And it's a great time. Well, it is. It is. It's also a good opportunity to um, introduce some new people, you know, because if you're doing something like that, very often you can get people who are engaged with kids or mm -hmm. whatever, young adults, and right. so forth. All right. Um, let's talk environment for just a minute. We all know that we have a huge triple E scare, reality, not just a scare, but a reality out there right now. Heard the planes flying over the house last night. Um, supposed to freeze tonight. Hopefully that'll kind of take the edge off of our little flying friends. Um, what else is going on related to that? Is there anything that anybody's looking at the macro picture of ticks? I mean, ticks are an ever-present public health mm. issue. Um, is there anything else that's going on sort of in that environmental world? There is concern, you know, aerial spraying is a flashback for me. I can remember the plane flying in the backyard with the DDT right mm -hmm. behind it mm -hmm. because there was a farm right behind me, okay? No one knew what was the disaster that it was. Okay, um, but at any rate, what's happening? So, with respect to the the spraying, you know, we've been on calls. We've, we had calls pretty much every other day yeah. um, for a couple of weeks with the Department of Public Health about, you know, what's what's going on with the spraying, what's going on with the with the approach. You know, we're in a critical triple E area yeah. here, as we know. Um, so, um, what they say about the spray is that uh, there are no. Um, expected impacts, as of course there never are, we don't right. know, but um, the ratios that we're talking about, especially with the aerial spraying, they say it's, it's the equivalent of a shot glass of insecticide, um, insecticide per what's effectively a, a football field's worth of area. So it's a very small 
kind of dosage. It has to be uh, implemented and sprayed in very specific weather conditions, mm. which has kind of hampered you know, yeah. the, the coverage ability and made it very difficult to let people know when the spraying is going to happen because yeah. it's weather dependent. But we heard that the um, second round of spraying, which they came in and did, um, you know, when the weather stayed warm and the mosquitoes uh, didn't die off, uh, should have ended last night. Mm -hmm. um, it was expected to end last night, assuming the weather um, uh, cooperated. One of the things that we've been asking about is not only human health impacts, which of course are essential, but um, insects, you know, and I've been doing a lot of work on pollinators, yeah. um, and MDAR has been very uh, responsive to reaching out to local um, hobbyists to uh, evaluate hives both before and after to make sure that um, our kind of insect and environmental needs are also protected with this spray. So, so far so good. There have been no um, real negative impacts on other types of, of wildlife or the environment. Let's just either. take a pause there and just say to our, we have a lot of bee hobbyists in Holliston. Mm -hmm. If in fact anybody has encountered any issues, um, either contact us now by sending a, a, a message over Facebook or um, get in touch with your right. office no, I'd be very as, soon as, uh, as soon as you do notice something because I think that information is critical, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of long-term planning and, and what we're doing. I mean, I don't know about anybody else. I pay attention to songbirds, and the songbird situation is a disaster in terms mm -hmm. of the, the loss of songbirds. It's not all because of insecticides. There are a sure. myriad of issues, but the, the issue is that, you know, songbirds are... Mm -hmm. singing their last tunes, so mm -hmm. to speak. Well, the other thing it's important for people to know about the Triple E is that it goes in um, phases, so multi-year phases. So we um, are expecting that they're probably going to be an equivalent concern next year. Really? Uh, high that likelihood that there will be. So um, we're kind of working our way through the immediate crisis, crisis and immediate yeah. needs right now, but there is an effort ongoing to look to next year now and start to you know, make sure that uh, areas where mosquitoes are breeding are monitored and maintained. Um, encourage, you know, folks to look around their own homes for areas Gosh, where there's the standing water where yep. mosquitoes might breed to minimize yep. the impact. So that is, you know, I just want to assure the public that all of that kind of planning and strategy is in place and on the table. Uh, and they'll, you know, hopefully be hearing more. Why about does that. it continue? Is it that it's it's in the birds, and so the birds might last another year, or how does it how does it manage to survive winter? I guess that's, you know, that's that's beyond my okay. Uh, okay. my scientific capability. <laughs> yeah. I, but I, there are um, uh, toxicologists and and folks that are you know, Smart PhDs <laughs> in in those things that are working with the Department of Public Health to mm. anticipate. And what, what was interesting to me is that there are, um, you know many, many different types of mosquitoes, which I didn't realize, uh, all within a certain area and only certain types of mosquitoes carry Carrier. Tripoli. Mm -hmm. So that's where all the monitoring comes in. Um, and, you know, they have spots in town where they collect the mosquitoes Samples, and yeah. monitor for the presence of both Triple E and uh, West Nile. So when, um, in the, in, again, some iteration of life, uh, we used to have mosquito control go into like swamp areas with backpacks. Does that kind of stuff happen still? Do you know? I don't know about the backpacks, but I do know that they have testing locations all over. You know, they would just go in with the backpacks and spray. That's I should have. That was an incomplete oh, sentence. Oh, yeah, the, yes. You know that they'll go in with, in other words, not using aerial spray and not even using truck spray, but they would actually go in ground with spray. ground spray. Yep. Yeah. They still do that. It's done through the local mosquito control effort, which towns can either choose or not choose to participate in. So Holliston does participate in that. So um, the aerial spraying is kind of a next sure. level, but there has been and will continue to be as long as needed the ground spraying in town yeah. okay um, and that's you know that's the program there are some folks that opt out of that spray yes you see those signs right yeah. so I've had questions actually to the office you know what does this level of crisis mean for um, lots that have asked to be excluded from spraying and that's what does that hard. mean for neighbors so the answer to that is that it's it's not a black and white you know it really depends on the level of urgency in that area it depends on the sensitivity of what's being protected, whether it's a water resource or... So all of that is kind of worked out through the regional mosquito control board. What a nightmare. Um, case by case. What yeah. a nightmare, all from one of those little vicious bugs. I know. It's, it's a Seriously. quite an extensive I mean, organizational like, wow. effort. Anyway, okay, so you're next. 
Um, next, so, you know, pending bills before the legislature, I think we've talked about some of these before, kind of the high-profile issues are education and education funding, yeah. which is perennially a, a big issue. There has been, a, I would say, a uniform commitment to putting more money into our public schools that would come from the state to support local um, school systems. The conversation right now and the reason why the issue has been hung up is that uh, the three uh, players, the House, the Senate, and the governor all kind of have their approach <laughs> that they would like to see, which doesn't come down as much to the money that's going to be spent, but how it's allocated and the regional equity. And as you know, a lot of this funding comes from the state through a formula. And depending on how the formula is constructed, different towns get different amounts sure. of money. So, of course, depending on the proposal, is going to have very different impacts on individual communities who are represented by legislators. So a lot of it is kind of this balance about how do we get to a place where we believe that all of our communities, whether it be kind of our, our struggling schools to our, you know, communities like our, our suburban communities like ours to, you know, Western mass communities, how do we make sure that everyone gets their fair share? So that's the Given that computers can come up with algorithms that, that pinpoint that I have an interest in songbirds and bury me in ads for feeders mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff, can't some computer program generate what would make the most sense in terms of evening out for non-political reasons where the money would go? Isn't there a way to craft a formula that says there, there may be, you know, everybody's going to get something. So you just start, you sort of plug there, and then you just add. If you have a level, a higher degree of poverty, if you have a higher degree, you know, is okay. Well, and I think everyone, I think that all the proposals on the table, I would think if you ask the advocates, they would probably say that their There's formula the makes one. the most sense, right? So maybe the conversation just needs to be nothing except the formula. Maybe there is no other conversation needed. You know, get agreement on the formula. Mm -hmm. And those those conversations are uh, are ongoing. And we, I thought this would have been done. Yeah. You know, before August. Yeah. Uh, now we're looking at you know hopefully sometime this fall would be great. Yeah. But stay yeah, tuned. Then you, you start budgeting already. Right. You know you start budgeting this fall. Right. Late Coming fall. into town meeting. Yeah. Yep. It's crazy. And, and the other else? thing is is the hands free. Uh, distracted oh, driving. One that's gone on and on and legislation. On. It's got seven lives. It, yeah, it's um, it's a little a little mysterious uh, actually. Um, at the end of July, everyone had full confidence that it was going to be done. Um, there are two elements to the bill. One is an enforceable, uh, hands-free, no no driving with a physical unit in your hand, with uh, penalties, you know, monetary pen penalties associated with it. And the second component is around um, gathering um, demographic information at the time of traffic stop. Oh. To be able to look at um, patterns in traffic stops and things like that. So, um, two very separate conversations, separate sets Why of aren't concerns. They separate bills? So, you know, the legislative process, you know, one, one party wants their bill to be attached to another because they're afraid if some part of it moves on, the other part never will. So that's a little bit of the, the negotiation. But there was, in July, a document that was initially understood to have agreement from all parties, from both the House and the Senate. There was language. Um, our, our House conferees signed off on the language. And for some reason, um, it has stalled. And the Senate members never mm. actually signed off on the final language, and it's not clear why, truthfully. Um, it's not clear which aspect of the legislation is of concern, what the sticking points are. Um, all of this, as you know, is worked out in conference committee, which is essentially you know, three members of the House, three members of the Senate, which represent both parties, who are kind of negotiating and haggling over these differences. And the public um, is not really privy to this. As you can imagine, in negotiations, you don't really reveal your cards. So, the hope, uh, the advocates are getting a little frustrated mm. who have been pushing for this. You know, families who have had impacted family members are obviously eager to get this done, as are we. So uh, a lot of pressure on there, and I, I'm hopeful that that will kind of free up and we'll work through that and get that done soon. Some of this stuff just keeps going and going and going. It does. You know, I feel like it, in particular now, you know, I've been in this body now for over 10 years, and right now it just feels like there's a lot of kind of wait, waiting, 
waiting um, on complex legislation, more so than usual. Is the, well, I guess when you talked about collecting demographic information from the stops and stuff, of course, that just sends mm -hmm. that little buzz in my head that says, oh my goodness, is this another place in which we are exposed, we meaning the residents and public are exposed to being, you know, pigeonholed into a category or mm -hmm. pieces of information that get to be used or misused someplace down the line. Um, so it may be that it's that kind of concern. It may be something completely unrelated, but as soon as you mm -hmm. said the word, collecting demographic information, yeah. you know, there's that little buzz. And that buzz has less to do with us directly and more to do with the federal picture of, you know, what is everybody after, mm -hmm. you know, um, the whole privacy issues, all of the privacy issues after 9-11 and so forth. I mean, that's just a, a macro mm -hmm. issue now. So I can imagine when it gets down to, to you know, this level, it's Although, the same thing. Um, this type of data mm -hmm. um, has been, there was a law passed in, I think it was 2000, that required on police stops. There are five discrete categories of, of um, you know, ethnicity, nationality that, that are required to be collected by police and have been for 20 years almost. Um, I think the change now is that we've got the e-citation system, so it's all electronic. Mm -hmm. So you're, um, you can't overlook that anymore. It's, it's become a more um, urgent uh, issue about how and when that information must be collected because you can't, again, skip, skip that information on traffic stops. So, you know, the House has said it will be collected only when there's a citation issued. Uh, the Senate version initially said that it would be c collected at all stops, regardless of whether there's a citation issued. So, um, and there are additional complexities to that. But the bottom line is that the police have been collecting and asked to be collecting this information for a long time. And there are uh, training, presumably, that would educate them in instances where it's not clear mm -hmm. as to, you know, what they select for a category, that there are ways to, to get to that information without causing a you know a safety interaction with with the folks that they've they're talking to on the road everything's gotten more complex everything so is incredibly com all the easy stuff is done that Mary is, yeah. so we're now into the into yeah, the really yeah, complicated yeah. stuff so do you have anything else that we were going to touch on um, I think you know I think um, that's probably it the only thing I'll mention I guess is the especially when it comes to local um, resource needs, you know, cities and towns, we always love to bring money back to our cities and towns for our local needs. And we in the House passed a bill called Greenworks mm -hmm. um, before our summer break. And that all that does essentially is take uh, up to a billion dollars in capital funding over 10 years to put in forms of grants to cities and towns to address clean energy, like solar and wind installations, electric vehicles, things like that. Uh, resiliency, so any you know flooding issues, dams, things like that, and uh, energy efficiency. So it really is kind of a wide open program that would provide pretty much a pool of money to cities and towns for anything that they wanted to do in that regard. So it really kind of frees up some creative thinking um, for cities and towns to do hopefully some creative Has things. that passed? Uh, it passed the House. Okay, so we're off to the Senate. So we're off to the to the Senate. It's a big priority of the House Speaker, which means it's probably going to be in this negotiated, you know, with the big, oh, with the yeah. governor's housing bill, housing, and the speaker's got his climate bill, yeah. and, right? And then we'll see what so the, the Senate, Senate president kind of prioritizes for her needs. So that's kind of the dance we'll be playing this fall. But I have high hopes that you know this this will be a meaningful um, set of of uh, funding opportunities for our towns to take advantage of. Looking ahead to the quarter between September and December, come December you'll be filing new bills and all that. No, happened. no. no. Oh, wait so a minute. We're, we're at the in end the of first oh, that's year. Right. That's right. Um, of, of your two-year session. Of our two-year session. Okay. So we Good are point. still rolling along. Heavy into the hearing committee hearings. Yep. Process trying to move bills out of committee. Anything you're really hoping for? Um, yeah, you know, there's some low-hanging stuff. I've got a, uh, a Beagle Freedom Bill that I filed. Beagle? Beagle Freedom Bill. Dog? Is, that's what it's called, the dog. So what you may not know is that Massachusetts is one of the largest um, users of animal research because of our biotech um, presence. And animals play a really important role in finding, you know, cures to diseases that, are, that have a real um, 
devastating impact on humans. But um, what my bill would do is recognizing their contributions and the importance of these animals to make sure that if they're healthy, they have an opportunity to be adopted out um, into loving homes at the end. So it's a partnership with the um, our local and statewide shelter organizations to require these um, biotech research facilities, educational facilities, to have agreements with um, some institution or some venue to be able to adopt these animals out um, at the end of their lives. So hmm. that had a hearing last week. It's got a lot of good support. I think it probably will come out of committee. I think it, it might come to the floor. That's kind of one of my, my little... Mm -hmm. um, pet bills that I'm working on. There's another pet bill that was on the radio this morning about the the um, therapy dogs and the the um, needs. Yep. Yeah. And okay. defining um, defining who is a therapy dog yep. and so forth. I hope they do take care of that because there are times when dogs are wearing those you know special therapy kinds of. Um, coats mm -hmm. that you know full well they're not therapy dogs because of the way they behave. I mean, we have a therapy dog in the family. We know right. how she behaves. And um, they just, they're just not, you know. So the others tend to be a little more aggressive. And so you get into a situation that could be really threatening to the person that is originally intended to, to need the service dog. You know, uh, a blind person, for God's sake, having a therapy dog that's not a therapy dog, and he attacks the blind person's dog. I mean, really, just unacceptable. So I'm a co-sponsor of that legislation, and okay. I actually just wrote a letter to uh, to uh, Ways and Means. I think it's in Ways and Means now um, to ask yeah, for it to be reported critical. out. You know, I think it's it's important for all the reasons you mentioned. It's also it's businesses kind of get stuck in the middle where, you know, it's not clear they need to to comply with ADA. You know, make sure they allow service dogs into their Airplanes or whatever, you know, wherever the access to the public, it's it's very unclear, you know, to them who, who they're required to let in and who they aren't. Yeah. Um, so it makes it challenging. So I think clarity mm. will help everyone. everybody. And everybody. so I'm, I'm hoping that will that will come this session as well. Okay. So the energy stuff is really kind of what's on my plate. I'm the the uh, vice chair of this this session, and really, um, I've got uh, an electric vehicle. There's a more EV program, mm -hmm. which is subsidies for people to, to buy electric vehicles, and they're pretty healthy subsidies, about $1,500 uh, a vehicle. So that program is slated to run out by the end of September. Mm -hmm. And uh, I included in, uh, as an amendment in the Greenworks legislation, funding to continue that program um, with a pretty healthy, healthy funding support. The governor now just filed a supplemental budget, which uh, appreciate his inclusion of um, an equivalent amount of money and commitment in the SUP budget, which would be kind of on a, a more fast track basis. Yeah. So looking forward to working with my colleagues to support that in the SUP budget, which will be coming out in the next couple of weeks, which is critical, again, to keep this program, because once you turn off programs, it's oh, yeah, really it's hard, hard to, to turn, turn it back, back on. on again. Yep. So a uh, lot of support in the legislature for that sure. um, around controlling emissions. Climate really... Everybody's um, got a little bit of a buzz on that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's generally generationally important. I, I get a lot of grandparents, you know, what, what does this mean for my grandchildren? Oh, How, yes. What can I do? Yep. You know, so I, uh, it's so, the, the energy world is so complicated. It has been really an education for me to understand, you know, the grid. And part of our problem is our, our grid is oriented toward these large power producers right. sending power out to communities. Now what we're talking about is changing all the wiring and infrastructure to accommodate all these smaller power providers all around the grid. Now, that's an engineering task to figure out how to do that, and it's going to cost money. So who's going to pay? You know, are the solar companies going to pay? Are the utilities going to pay? Are the ratepayers going to pay? Who's going to pay for all that um, and make sure that our energy needs, you know, we don't have brownouts, and we continue to provide for the energy needs that we, we need to grow and be economically uh, healthy. So it's, it's a lot, but it's, it's great. I'm, I'm loving that part of it. And yeah. I think we're going to continue to see more energy issues, whether it be storage um, and, you know, legislation that will facilitate, maybe incentivize uh, companies to focus on storage research mm -hmm. and creative ways. We're looking for creative ways and things to do um, that will get us to the to a greener net net uh, net energy or net uh, emissions uh, zero mm -hmm. um, playing field, at least in Massachusetts. Hopefully lead the way and give Hopefully. some tools to others to follow along. 
Sounds good. Well, good luck in the next quarter. I'll see you Thank in you. Yes. December, I guess. Uh, we'll be talking about snowflakes and holidays. And it's supposed to be a cold winter, cold snowy winter. Oh, it depends on which. It depends on which report you listen to. <laughs> so anyway, thanks as always, thanks for and uh, have a have a good time in uh, the state house. All right, folks, that's it for today, and thank you very much. Get in touch with us if you have questions. Get in touch with Carolyn if you want to report anything, and we'll see you later. Bye.